we will continue our discussion on context free grammars and languages in this class too. First of all, what I would like to do is to complete an argument, which partially I did last time. And uh, that is about, recall this grammar G, which had three non terminals S, A and B. And the terminal symbols were just two, small a and small b. And we had these production rules. And uh, what we said was that the language generated by G, this grammar, which of course, by definition and that is why I put this symbol, which, which reads as language generated by G is by definition is e equal to the set of all terminal strings, which are each of which is derived. That is all the terminal strings that you can derive from the start symbol S. That is of course, the language associated with the grammar G, which we call the language generated by G. And the claim was that this language is precisely those strings over A and B, where the number of A's is equal to number of B's. Right? This is what I am writing here. So, this is of course, is something we would be interested in proving, because that is what we say is about the language. Right? just looking at the grammar, it may not be immediately clear. So, we would like to prove what the language is. Now, we also said last time that to do so, I need to prove, prove two other claims and that is A derives all strings. Right? See, there are two non terminals other than S, A capital A and capital B and we would like to claim that this non terminal generates all strings over terminal symbols small a and small b, where the number of a's is exactly one more than number of b's. So, for example, a string like a b a a b, here the number of a's is exactly one more than number of b's, because there are three a's and two b's. And similarly, the set of strings which are derived starting from the non terminal B is precisely those terminal strings, where number of B's is exactly one more than number of A's. So, for example, if I had written something like this A B B A B here this particular string, if you notice that there are three B's and two A's this string therefore, should be in the set generated from the non terminal B. And there are, I have said this even in the context of when we are, when we are, uh, when we discuss regular languages that you see that I would like to prove the equality of these two sets. That is the set of all strings, which are generated from the start symbol, which is by definition in this case of course, uh, language generated by G. And uh, in some manner, I am describing a set of strings over A and B, which is this. Right? This is the predicate, which is satisfied by W. And therefore, I can talk of that this is a set of strings over A and B. And point is that we would like to show the equality of these two sets. And when you show equality of two sets, and this is the point we have made in our discussion uh, many times, that see this is of the form that I have this set, let us say S 1 and another set S 2, and we would like to prove the equality. Typically, this is done by showing S 1 is a subset of S 2 and 
S 2 is a subset of S 1. What I definitely, I, I hope I have been able to convince you last time that it is the case that the set of all strings, which have equal number of A's and B's, they would be generated by S. How did we do that? We said, you know, similarly, if, if you look at this, that let me let me say this set is, uh, I don't, let's, let me call this set as you know, I am just giving a name P 1 and this right hand side is P 2 and let me say this left hand side, this set is Q 1 right and right hand side set is Q 2 right and let me say left hand sides of this equality, this is also a equality between two sets this is R 1 and right hand side, let me just call it R 2 for the time being. I think you would agree that we showed last time was that P 2 is a subset of P 1. Similarly, Q 2 is a subset of Q 1 and R 2 is a subset of R 1. This we proved. How did we prove it? Just uh, we will remind ourselves what we said was that we prove all these three assertions simultaneously by means of what is called simultaneous induction. So, we are using an induction, but over all these three are being proved by induction, but simultaneously we are doing it. So, let us say that this something is true up to a certain length, all these three statements are true up to a certain length. Let us say k, what it means is all strings of length k or less, which have equal number of a's and b's, they will be generated by uh, the start symbol s and so on. Then, the induction is over this k, we showed that if that, that I take as the induction hypothesis, then you know the next bigger string also is something I will be able to generate. That is you know these assertions I can prove for the next you know assuming about k and then I can prove for k plus 1 and so on. And it is not difficult to see in order to prove the assertion, this assertion for the next length, I needed to use uh, these two also and so on. To make, to prove this for the next length, I needed to use the other two for the, so that is that's what is simultaneous induction is all about that simultaneously we prove all these three assertions. So, here our point was that the induction is over length of the strings that we are talking about. In the, you know these sets have strings and each string has a length and our induction we are inducting over lengths of these strings. Now, just so, can I say that this we have already done this part. Now, today let me just indicate how do I do the other part, so that I can prove the equalities. So, basically today I need to at least indicate the, so P 2, now I, I said that P 1 contains as a subset P 2, this is something we proved. Now, therefore, I need to prove assertions like this, right.
R one is a subset of R. If I manage to prove these three also, then all six together means P two is equal to P one, and which of course means what we wanted to assert about the language generated by G. Now, so, so what, what is this saying for example? This is saying that every string which is derived from S, every string over uh, the terminal alphabet which is over the symbols a and small a and small b, every such string has the property that it has equal number of a's and b's, is not it. This is what this means, that every left hand side is about strings which are terminal strings which are generated from s. Similarly, this is about terminal strings generated from a and this is about terminal strings generated from r. Now, again we would do in order to prove these three assertions, you would again prove them simultaneously, again we will use induction, but now we shall use induction on the length of derivation. Okay. So, so let me say for example, oh, the induction is now what do we mean by this? See, for example, starting from S. I get alpha 1, then alpha 2, that is from alpha 1 I get alpha 2, then alpha 3, so on, alpha n, right. And this is an element of the terminal alphabet, suppose I have. So, what is the length of this derivation? This is a derivation starting from S ending in alpha n, this such a derivation, we, the length is clearly how many times I have used this derivation, one step derivation, you can see we have used it n times. So, length of this derivation is n. Okay. So, let us, let us try to look at the base case, which is kind of very, very obvious. Suppose, the, by the way, does do you get any string at all in one step, any terminal string in one step uh, from S? You actually do not. If you see what happens is, in if you start from S, you can only use these two and in one step you can write this or you can write this, in an either case you do not get uh, any terminal strings. So, we can for S the base case will be let us say 2. So, there are 2 strings of length 2 which have equal number of A's and B's, which are A B and B A. Right? And you can verify that both of these can be derived from S, right? And uh, for now, if we if we if we want to do everything um, from length, so let us say that for A also, capital A also, we can derive in one step uh, terminal string small a. Similarly, for B one step I can derive a terminal string b. In two steps starting from b, can you get anything again you cannot, because this will be like if you start from a, in one step of course, you can get this, but you will see the two steps you cannot, but whatever it is the base, base case can be handled and I leave it as an exercise what should be the proper base. 
which you can do this. So, let us say that base we have handled and now some what is the assertion that I can I want to say the assertion is that induction hypothesis is that up to k length of derivation all lengths of derivation all derivations whose lengths are k or less they for this these three properties will be satisfied which these properties are of course we have said here now how do i go one more step so let us say i am talking of a derivation whose length is k plus 1 for s So, that such a derivation, so let us say consider a derivation of length k plus 1 starting with s. Okay. So, you start with s. Now, the point and that is something which is very simple to observe, but once we observe this, the proof becomes very clear. Right? So, this will the first is something alpha 1 and then I have alpha 2 from alpha 1 and here I will have alpha k. Now, here what I have that here is first step, what could, have, could it have been? Either let us say this, uh, sorry, this or this. So, let us say I have my first thing is first step in that derivation. So, take whichever derivation of length k plus 1 and then I have this. Right. Now, what, what we are saying, you see that alpha 2, how did I, did I get alpha 2? Alpha 2 therefore, necessarily is something a string, which is of the form, can you see this that alpha 2 has to be a string, which is of the form a and then let us say alpha 2 dash and what is this alpha 2 dash? Alpha 2 dash is a string which can be derived from the non terminal b. And now, I use the induction hypothesis, this string necessarily will be of the, the total this derivation. If I just take out this a, which will always appear in alpha 2, alpha all, all the way up to alpha k. If I take these a's out, then I am talking of a length k derivation starting with the non terminal b. right? By induction hypothesis, this will be some string, right, which has one more b's than the number of a's, it, which will be a string over a's and b's, because that is what we are assuming that alpha k is a string over a's and b's, and alpha k is of the form a alpha k. So, if I take the leave that first a out, what is left? If I call that alpha subscript k dash that string has to be generated is something which is derived from b in steps k because the total you know starting from here we are doing it so that is total thing was i'm sorry this was let us say k plus 1 so the length was k plus 1 and now we are doing uh, from here alpha 2 to so which is which is from here to this which is a length k derivation of b when i do a put a dash taking the small a out and that is a string which has got one more b's than a's and now in front of that there is a small a the total number of a's and b's will be equal because so 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 you can see that we can this in this manner simultaneously taking all these three assertions at the same time and we can do a induction point I am saying is now we do the induction on lengths of derivation, 
whereas in this part we did the induction again we did simultaneous induction, but on lengths of strings. Here uh, is an example of a context free language, which if you think for a second, you will realize that this is not a regular language, right? It is this language, the set of all strings over A B, where the number of A's is equal to number of B's, very easily you can show that this set is not a regular set. So, L G is not regular. So, I have at least one example of a language, which is not regular, but which is context free, because here is this context free grammar, which generates that language. What about regular languages themselves? Can we generate every regular language by a context free grammar? You see, the reason is, suppose why this question is important? The reason for that, the, the importance is, this is the set of all languages, which are context free. So, this is the class of context free languages. And here, for example, I got this set, which is not a regular set. Now, there could have been two possibilities, when some elements here are not regular, is either that this is also a possibility, if I say that this set is regular, it could be that there are some regular languages, which are not context free. For example, if this is the picture, then this is a regular language, which is not context free. What we are going to show, that is not the case. In fact, all regular languages will be context free languages. So, that statement in picture, what does it mean? Here is the class of regular languages. When I say every regular language is also context free, that means this set, this class is a subset of context free class. What more I know there are examples uh, of languages, which are context free, but not regular. So, this containment is actually proper, and this is really the right picture. I need to show you this. So, therefore, I need to show that this is the claim that every regular language is a context free language. So, if I manage to prove this along with the example that I have here of one context free language, which is not regular, that means the picture or the relationship between these two classes is that, that the class of context free languages properly contains regular languages. In that sense, we have progressed. If I manage to show that, you know, we had some set, we, did, we, we, we described its properties, we did many things with regular languages, but we also saw that, you know, certain simple languages could not be regular languages, and here I have a larger class. And you know, overall, what uh, this this course is trying to do is to ultimately be able to capture all languages which are computable in the most general sense. All right. So we would like to prove this. Let me give you an example. 
of how would the proof go and then, then we can formalize that example to see the proof exactly. So, let us let us actually take a, a context free language and of course, context free language you can describe by a, a DFA. So, why not take a D, take a DFA. So, let, let me particular in particular consider this DFA, okay. it has two states and uh, the You should be able to almost look at this and immediately say what what is the language accepted by this DFA, and that language is very clear that it is the set of all binary strings where the number of ones is odd, right? All right. So let's I'll show you how to get a context-free language for uh, that language context free grammar for that language that is the set of all binary strings, where the number of ones is odd. Do not care anything about zeros if you notice in this example and uh, the way we are going to do this is uh, we will associate a non terminal with every state of this DFA. So, let me call this state as A, this state as B, right? And what we are going to do is, if you see, uh, what does it say? So, so, so let me first uh, write something that it's very easy that from every non-terminal that I have written, which is of course corresponds to a state, my uh, rules are going to be that you consider a transition. So, here one transition is this, right. So, I will put like that. So, A 0 A, we will we'll, we'll justify this is a little later. A and again starting from A, I have another arrow going out, which is 1 followed by B. So, and Similarly, I would write for B, right? B is uh, you know one arrow is like that. So, 0 B, B is also 1 A. Now, that is how I have taken there are four transitions, four uh, tra arrows, you know, four transitions which were there. I got these four rules plus I need to take off consider one more kind of uh, productions rules, which will correspond to all those arrows, which are ending in a final state. Here there is of course, one final state you see. So, starting from A using 1 I could have gone to B, which is a final state. So, in such a case I will also A, I will just write 1 and not write this, uh, the state. You see this arrow, this transition I used to define this particular rule A goes to 1 B, but since B is also ha uh, happens to be, I mean B happens to be a final state of the DFA. I will also use, uh, I will also define another rule A goes to 1, where I just do not. So, this is this is something which ending not in, uh, there, there is no on the right hand side, there is no non terminal. So, 
similarly you see this b so b can go to see right because b can be rewritten as 0 b but b happens to be a and this this kind of removal of the state or the non terminal symbol i do only for only on the right hand side well that makes sense right and now i claim the grammar where i have see let me define the grammar now g is v and then of course 0 1 uh, p and the start symbol here is a because that's the state at which was the initial state okay and these are my productions now now notice this um, in this example why should i how can i claim that this grammar the language cor corresponding to that grammar is actually the set of all strings which are accepted by this finite state automata. So, the idea for that is not difficult. We would like to show what is our problem? We would like to show that the language which is accepted by this DFA is equal to the language generated by this context free grammar. By the way, that it is a context free grammar, it is clear, because every production rule is of that form that left hand side is a non terminal and right hand side is a string over the union of the two sets terminal and non terminal. Okay. So, formally we would like to show that the language accepted by the DFA m is same as the language generated by the grammar g and as before again there are two uh, parts in this proof normally that language g accepted by m is a subset of the language generated by g so and this is other, the other ways that lg is a subset of l m so let's say proof sketch for for a for part 1 i need to show that every string which is accepted by the dfa m can be also generated by this grammar g let's do that so if i have a string which is accepted by uh, this machine m that such a string supposing that string is let me say a 1 a 2 a n which is which is where each a i is uh, 0 or 1 and what, where do you start as a st in the initial state is a so let me just write it a and then this a1 came you will be in some state here either a or b so this is you know whatever state you are here and finally there is only one accepting state and here you would have gone to b so let me show you the idea with with a simple example maybe then you should be able to do it yourself so let's say i have this 0 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 right now this this is a string which will be accepted by ab and let's see how it how how for this string the state transition for the machine is going to be so i'm just writing this string is a little separate i mean the symbol separately separated so that i can write out the states clearly 0 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 here we'll start at the initial state a and on zero remember the machine stays 
in the state itself, right. So, A, A and on this one from A it will go to B and then B again if you are in state B and a 0 comes you remain there. So, B and then on this one you will come back to A and then here you are going to remain in A, here you will go to B and on this also you will go to B. Now, looking at this and looking at this uh, set of uh, production rules, I can show you that what will be the corresponding derivation. See, I would like to show that since this string is accepted, because this string takes the machine from A to the accepting state, initial state A to the accepting state B. So, this string is accepted by the machine M and the claim is that this string can also be generated by the grammar G and you just follow. So, this the derivation will go like this A, you know we will start, because that is the start symbol here A. Now, I see what happens here. 0 came and then go going to state A. So, let me just write this is allowed, because if from A I can use this 0 A and then. So, so do you see what is happening? A this was the old state symbol new state symbol new state state. This is the old state where do you go 0 a, right? but this 0 is already there. So, so, now you can see what is happening. Basically, we are traversing the string and keeping track. This derivation is keeping track in a way, what is the state in which the machine would have been having scanned the string 0 0. It would be in state a. Now, comes a. So, from A on 1, the machine M goes to B and for that I have to capture that, I have that, that in non-terminal A can generate 1 B. So, this I rewrite this A as 1 B. Again, you can see the same uh, invariant, which is in our mind now as we do it holds when that invariant is the you know that if partially if you if you come up to a point and what whatever wherever is the state uh, of the machine M is then the grammar also generates the first part of the string and that corresponding non terminal so this is how it goes so 0 0 1 b and now 0 0 1 and this b remember that this is seeing 0. So, it is 0 b can you see what is happening. So, this way it will just go on and when you are here right after scanning 0 0 1 0 1 0 1 easy to see the machine is in state B, right, and you will see that you can also generate our derivation will generate 1 0 1 and now the non terminal at the end is B. And you see what is happening is here from B on 0 we are going to B, which is fine in in it for so far as the machine is concerned, but now the derivation must end from this B B I will just derive since B is a final state of the machine M and corresponding non terminal B if you notice I have this production. So, this B I will rewrite it as 0 only 0 and there is and then the derivation stops. So, basically this derivation also mimics the way 
the string is recognized. I mean, as, as, the, as you present the string to the machine, the machine is going from state to state, right? And after scanning some first initial part of the string, the this machine is in some state, and what we are claiming is the, our generation generative device, this grammar, starting from its start symbol, it would generate that prefix, and then it will be in that the last part, what last symbol of that generation is a symbol, which non terminal, which corresponds to the state in which the machine would have been after generating that prefix. But, we have to end somewhere, when we end the final state, is, is, we end in a final state, so far as machine is concerned and that we would use a production like this to say that, you know, there is no more as in this case, no more non terminal in, in, in the string that we have. So, the generations of the of in this particular case stops, right. So, we have a terminal string, right. I will not formally prove this, this is not too difficult to prove both these parts. So, I, I kind of sketched that this side that language accepted by the machine, every string which is accepted by the machine name can also be generated by the grammar G and it is not too difficult using the same intuition that every string which is generated by the grammar G is also accepted by machine name for this particular example. I will not prove that, but let me indicate what I should do in general. Right? This is the statement which we would like to show, which we would like to prove and I give you an example, right. Given a regular, given a regular language, how in this example at least, we know how we could get a context free grammar, which generates the same language. The way we can prove this statement is by taking a general regular language. So, let L be regular. Let, since it is regular, let M Q sigma delta Q 0 F be a DFA to accept L. And what we will show is, we will give you a construction that we define the context free grammar grammar G and let me use this subscript M. That means, this grammar G is obtained is defined using the machine M from the definition of M such that the language accepted by the machine M, which is of course, L is same as the language generated by this grammar context free grammar G subscript M. And let me show you the construction and the proof that it is indeed the case is something we can leave, because the ideas are very simple for the proof. The construction is nice. So, it essentially it is the generalization of the earlier example. So, this G M Remember, it is a context free grammar. So, it has to define it, I need to define four components V, that set of terminals. Notice already I have got one component, the set of terminals 
for the machine m is sigma and that is the set of terminals for our grammar also p and s okay now what is v right v is let me let me write it this way v q1 v q2 right or instead of writing v let me just call it maybe a q1 a q2 a q n so it has n uh, non terminals v is this set where q1 uh, qn just in fact let me just make it q1 because i'm using so the start state is q1 itself right equal to q so that means that what I am trying to say is that suppose this machine has n states and I have num named them q 1 through q n, then for every such state I have a non terminal and which simple uh, way of saying uh, stating the correspondence would be that you subscript uh, a non terminal name with this state name. And S is actually a q 1. What is q 1? q 1 was the start state of the machine m and your start symbol of the non terminal which is the start symbol of the grammar is the non terminal which corresponds to the start state of the uh, DFA. Now, I have said what v is, what sigma is, what s is and so I need to say what p is right and we will go by what we said that if delta q i a right is q j right, delta is the transition function for the DFA if whenever I have such a thing, there will be for every symbol I will and for every state I will have such a thing, we at the production we have right that A q i goes to can be written as rewritten as can be replaced by A A q j. In addition, we also have a q i goes only to a if q j happens to be q j is an element of the set of final states of the machine m. If you, if you see that is exactly what how we define that example uh, context free grammar, it is easy to see with these rules. What I have is of course, is a context free grammar and the claim is that grammar precisely generates the language accepted by the machine. And uh, the proof is some the intuition of the proof is again like that, that you consider uh, either a derivation in this grammar, in this grammar the derivation will be you will know you will start with a q 1 and you will keep generating strings, where there will be a non terminal always at the end and finally, we will replace that non terminal uh, by something you know uh, that by a by a symbol of the 
of this. And that is precisely one way you can see that particular string would have been accepted by the machine M. The machine M would have gone through the same sequence of states as the sequence of non terminals which appear at the end is in the derivation and as, as we had seen an example. Okay. So, it is not too difficult to prove that this construction the grammar that we get is this L G M is precisely the language accepted by this machine M. Once I prove that, then I have proved that you give me any context free language, I will be able to, if you, how will you give me, I can, I can ask you since L is a context free language, I am sorry, if you give me any regular language, I can ask you that let me start, uh, you give me the DFA for that regular course, which, which generates that or which, which, uh, which accepts that regular language. Once I have that DFA, here is a construction which through which I get a grammar and that grammar is precisely the language accepted by the DFA. And so, therefore, that regular language is also a context free language and therefore, we manage to prove this.